coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. Best recovery method is smart, intelligent programming for your big exercise days. Mm. Uh, you need to be able to recover from a stimulus that is recoverable. And that is a big mistake that many people make. They just crush themselves to the point of not being able to walk. And then it takes them seven to 10 days just to get a, uh, away from the delayed onset muscle soreness, let alone the neurological recovery associated. Mm -hmm. So sprinkling in intensity, sprinkling in all the variables that make something feel hard and take a toll on recoverability, that stuff needs to be dialed in because you know, there's no magic hack to recovery. There's no compression boot or supplement or ice immersion that is going to fix a shitty training schedule or a really mishaps and miscalculated training schedule. So I would say really looking at your volume, looking at your frequency, and also looking at the overall intensity, those should be the three biomarkers that we're looking at in order to ensure recovery. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed internationally recognized strength coach, speaker, and writer, Dr. John Russin. Dr. Russin is the owner of John Russin Fitness Systems, an online fitness platform geared towards synergizing the best of high performance and pain-free training to elite level athletes and general fitness clients across the world. This week, we discussed how to look, feel, function at your best, what is functional training, the seven habits of highly healthy people, top five reasons to implement sprinting into your routine, best ways to recover faster, and his one tip to get your body back to what it once was. Definitely enjoyed my interview with Dr. John Russin. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin and I have Dr. John Russin on. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Brian. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I've been a, a big fan of yours. I've followed you through Instagram and with all your different exercises and definitely something that I try to implement into my life. Um, and uh, Dr. John, maybe for, perhaps before we get into some questions, what, what, what got you into health and wellness and functional strength training and all your certifications and things like that? Uh, well, that's a loaded <laughs> question. Yeah, I, know. Uh, I started coaching 16 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I started in high performance athletics. So I worked, uh, alongside professional athletes also at Olympic training centers across the world. And about five years ago or so, I shifted from high performance athletics into general fitness. And that is where most of my methodologies, the certification courses, and my general clientele come from today. People that want to look, feel, and function their best and aren't necessarily making $20 million on the field on Sundays anymore. But yeah. the combination between health and performance together, no matter if you are an athlete or somebody that is looking to have a better lifestyle or extend longevity, uh, the same methodologies and the same systems are utilized in, in a quite similar way. Yeah. And I've, uh, I noticed you have a, um, a pain-free specialist certification. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and, and, uh, who's that geared towards? Yeah. So the pain-free performance specialist certification is the fastest growing uh, private certification in the fitness industry and arguably in fitness industry history. Uh, in the last four years, we've been able to certify over 13,000 coaches in person wow. live. And this is something that is geared towards fitness professionals. And we have a myriad of different professionals coming from different ends of the spectrum. So we have physical therapists, we have personal trainers, strength coaches, and also uh, physicians come through and even chiropractors. So it's very intriguing to mix and match different professions that are all allied in the same room, learning about pain-free training system and preventative proactive healthcare. I love the name of it because I feel like, you know, it's like, as we get older, I'm 42. It's like the, the probably the, but, but, well, how should I say this? You want to get stronger, but you don't, you, you want to do it pain-free. And you see a lot of people in the gym doing the wrong thing. So is that the basis behind the certification, teaching you like the right ways to do certain exercises and things like that? Right. That's the, that's the basis of the entire model. Usually you have performance or you have pain-free. Pain-free is commonly associated with, hey, you're not going to train hard and you have to kiss your results goodbye. Whereas performance on the opposite side is, hey, 
you're probably going to be hurt in the process and you are going to have to deal with pain in order to get, grab the gains. Right. So it doesn't have to be either one of these polarized ends of the spectrum. Why can't we achieve both simultaneously and utilizing the systems, the strategies, and ultimately the programming methodologies to manage any sort of client from any different client avatar, whether they're trying to lose weight or gain muscle or perform their best uh, at a triathlon, there are many principles that can hold true across spectrums because we all are indeed human beings at the end of the day. Yeah. What would you say some of the main principles behind becoming pain-free when you're training and things that probably people neglect when they're doing their training? I think having a more holistic approach to what a human being should be able to do physically. And we've lost this from a learned disuse model over the last you know, 30 years, but really more so in the last decade. Uh, we are having a more sedentary society naturally. Screen time is up to 13 hours and four minutes per day here in America, which is a pretty shocking statistic. And we have a learned disuse or a deactivation model of many of the fundamental movement skills that we were born to do. Squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, carry, being able to rotate and locomote our body through space. That is innate to being a human being. And it's very unique to being a human being, but from many chronic stresses, we have lost the ability to move properly and being able to reestablish a full movement system spectrum. That is one of the cardinal principles that we live by with our pain-free performance training model is how do we reestablish the way that somebody is able to move for life so they can essentially enjoy their function for life and extend not only their lifespan, but their quality of life and their longevity. Yeah. And you went through it, uh, the seven standards of functional strength. It was hip hinge, lunge, right? Horizontal push, vertical push, uh, horizontal pull, vertical pull, and locomotion. Maybe explain locomotion a bit. Locomotion is interesting because obviously we have our loaded movements, so we could be moving under load through space. But locomotion is anything that reciprocally moves your arms and legs uh, opposite of one another while carrying your body through point A to point B. So when we think about it like that, it's anything that we can be moving with and able to locomote. So that could be loaded carries, carrying a weight across the gym. It could also be sprinting or jogging, or dare I say walking, the most undervalued uh, health exercise out there today. Anything that truly allows us to move our body through space is considered locomotion. But it's not only about getting cardio or getting conditioning in with the carry pattern, but it's also about being able to neurologically link these different segments together. So we have our arm opposite of leg structured around the central core tenant, the shoulders, hips, and core working together. That is where we start talking about the, the principles and the tenets of pain-free training, having our entire body work as a functional unit the way that it's meant to be. Yeah. And you talk about like loaded carries and things like that. Probably people don't think about doing those things, um, but they're so, I guess I know functional is, is probably maybe an overused term, but you know, these are the simple things. And, you, and I know you talk a lot about glute training. I always say, you know, glutes are your biggest muscle and a lot of people neglect those things. Do you find that a common theme? Oh, it's definitely a common theme, but let's talk a little bit about what functional training is because 20 years ago, functional training was like, hey, we're going to have a kettlebell and a dumbbell and unstable surface and a band attached to your knee. And you're going to have your eyes closed. You're going to chew gum at the same time. You're going to hum and you're going to do a press. <laughs> that was what functional training was deemed to be. It's this, this really transferable functional task to daily living. But it got bastardized in the process. And now you got these bros out there that are fucking talking about, hey, bicep curls are functional because I have goals to have bigger biceps. So anything that's your goal is functional. Sorry, man, it's not. That's not the way that it's defined. So let's talk about what functional training actually is. It's having a rhyme and a reason for every single aspect of your body with a movement pattern that can transfer to skill and function for life. So that may be court sport. It may be field sport. It may be just living a better life out on the lake and like being able to like get on and off your boat. It depends how you train more importantly than what you train. And the basis of the functional model is more of a regional approach or dare I say a full body global movement patterning approach as opposed to this muscle-based approach. It's impossible physiologically and neurologically to isolate a single muscle out in an exercise. That information given 
everything really is functional because we have to have a more integrated approach. There's deeper layers to what a functional approach to standard programming is, but it really just comes down to, hey, having a rhyme and a reason of why your body is doing what it's doing and knowing where your body is in space and having something meaningful happen from toe all the way up to your bald ass head like mine. <laughs> and when you mentioned locomotion, you mentioned, you mentioned sprinting. Um, what would be some of the reasons for someone to implement sprinting into their routine or some, some type of sprinting? I always say sprinting can also be done and you can maybe agree or disagree on, on like a bike or a row machine or even in a pool. Um, but yeah, anyways, what were some, what would be some of the reasons to implement some type of sprinting routine? So the highest yield will be actual sprinting, like running on your two feet very fast through space. Sure. The reason that people tend to shy away from traditional sprinting is because of the high incidence of injury rates. Uh, we tend to get fucked up pretty easily if we don't have an intelligent on-ramp for sprinting. And that's not something that you go, oh, I've been inactive for the last three months. I haven't really sprinted in the last 10 years, but you know what? I'm going to go play a flag football with my bros. <laughs> I just drink four Coors Lights and I'm going to go like high stepping and boom, hamstring goes. You pop something and you're on the sideline again. And that's the vicious injury cycle. But having an on-ramp in terms of speed, like how fast you're running in terms of distance per sprint, but in terms of overall workload, those are three variables that you need to be working up little by little if you do indeed want to take full advantage of all the benefits of sprinting. Sprinting is the most dynamic power movement that a human being can go through. There are many, many different benefits for that um, from just straight up performance, from functional mobility to being able to integrate the kinematic chain the way that it's meant to be from a human perspective. But also uh, you talk about having a uh, high yield in terms of insulin sensitivity and being able to control some of uh, the hormones that are flowing through our body after specifically a training bout. There are so many different benefits, but getting back to that thing that is always in the back of people's minds. Last time I sprinted, I blew out my hamstring. So I need to look at some unconventional or some alternative based sprinting approaches, bike, elliptical, whatever you want to do. It's not going to reproduce the same amounts of theoretical benefits, but again, everything's a risk to reward. So we can work those same energy systems and maybe even the same patterns if our arms are working opposite of legs, something like an air bike or an uh, elliptical, but we really need to just say into account, what is our goal and how are we going to manage injury risk mitigation and trying to stay consistent and working hard enough and staying healthy enough so we can create momentum towards that goal. Yeah. I love that. And I know you mentioned the, the bike, I, I put a roll gecko bike and that thing is just, <laughs> that thing's the real deal. And I I've been, I've enjoyed doing some sprints on that. Um, if someone does want to implement sprinting, would you say like once every what seven to ten days? What would you say a good sort of um, routine would be to implement sprinting in? For many of the clients that I manage um, that are median age and median skill set, we usually work in only about once per week. And mm -hmm. once per week would be more in a regenerative uh, training day. So it wouldn't be programmed in on a heavy leg day, or you wouldn't be smoking yourself with some high end conditioning and then going to sprint. Most times we place it in and we place it in very conservatively after a big leg day. So as your regenerative day on like a lower day where we get in maybe anywhere from four to eight minutes of total sprint time with big rest periods so we can keep quality quotient up with our movement patterns. And then that's followed by something that is a little bit more joint friendly. Uh, it's a little bit more heart rate friendly, something like walking or something like the bike or elliptical at a zone two. But really sprinting a little bit goes a long, long way. And even you look at some of the top athletes in the world, they're not training their sprints more than three times per week even if sprinting is your actual sport. So taking that into account, there's many different ways to locomote our bodies through space. Sprinting maybe once per week and working your way up to going balls to the wall is most likely a smart move for many people. And then as far as just, I know you talked a little bit about recovery, uh, something that probably gets overlooked a lot of times when people get into fitness, right? They think, oh, I got to work out five, six times a week. What some of, what what are some of good like recovery hacks that you have for your clients that you find applicable for most people? Best recovery method is smart, intelligent programming for your big 
exercise days. Mm. Uh, you need to be able to recover from a stimulus that is recoverable. And that is a big mistake that many people make. They just crush themselves to the point of not being able to walk. And then it takes them seven to 10 days just to get a, uh, away from the delayed onset muscle soreness, let alone the neurological recovery associated. Mm -hmm. So sprinkling in intensity, sprinkling in all the variables that make something feel hard and take a toll on recoverability, that stuff needs to be dialed in because you know, there's no magic hack to recovery. There's no compression boot or supplement or ice immersion that is going to fix a shitty training schedule or a really mishaps and miscalculated training schedule. So I would say really looking at your volume, looking at your frequency, and also looking at the overall intensity, those should be the three biomarkers that we're looking at in order to ensure recovery. And it's almost a, it's a non-negotiable for me right now as a coach for my, many of my clients, especially the clients that have performance goals, is that if they cannot feel good enough to do the normal things that they do on a daily basis, that same day after a workout, then we really just pushed it too hard. You know, there's a lot of different tracking in terms of recoverability. You know, we have aura rings, we have HRV monitors, we have, we have everything in the world. But using common sense uh, is almost like a superpower today. And that is something that you feel in your own body different than any coach looking at a data sheet could ever associate. So taking that into account, the goal is to continuously take a step-by-step -step approach to get better over time. It doesn't matter how hard you train on Monday if Tuesday and Wednesday is non-trainable or is absolute shit training. We need to just keep the momentum moving forward. And recoverability is huge for that. But getting more specifically at actionable items for recoverability, we do a lot of walking. We do a lot of recovery zone, zone one and zone two heart rate work. And we like breathing, parasympathetic breathing specifically, in addition to some easy joint friendly mobility that will create the constructs of many of our quote unquote recovery off days. Uh, I am a big believer that you should be doing something seven days a week, even if it's going for a walk on day seven, mm -hmm. because your body will get used to it. Your body will acclimate to the chronic stresses in a good way that it can, again, recover from. So having a daily movement practice, it's huge for many people, but it doesn't always have to be, you know, 10 out of 10 efforts. You know, being able to cycle between high effort days, low effort days, and continuously churn forward and get the process moving. Again, I said the word momentum, that's extremely important. That's really the end goal. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, those are all yeah, great tips regarding recovery. Um, another one I know you mentioned a bit in uh in Instagram is uh soft tissue work. What type of um curious because like it's something that I've been making a habit of myself to do. Even if it's just like 15 minutes, you could literally do it for 15 minutes in front and watch a football game. It's like, instead yeah. of just sitting there, you know, you could do some soft tissue work. What are some of the, I know it's tough because there's so many different avenues to go down that, but like, what are some of maybe the big movers that people can focus on if they want to do some soft tissue work on their own? Soft tissue is great. Uh, we devote one to two minutes in the pre-training sequence. We call it the six phase dynamic warm-up sequence into soft tissue work. Essentially that's foam rolling 90% of the time. And we are focusing in on chronically tight areas or areas that are going to be actively trained uh, as the prime movers that training day. Things like, hey, we're going to squat. So let's make sure the quads are going to be foam rolled before we do that. Or, hey, we're doing bench press that day, pecs. You, you can get the, the kind of theme there. Mm -hmm. But that is one way to use it very, very quickly in a matter of one to two minutes in the pre-training sequence. From a recoverability perspective, you are going to have an immense amount of opportunity to maybe help your recovery a couple percent. You know, it's not going to be this absolute game changer from... 10 out of 10 delayed onset muscle soreness to, wow, I don't feel anything in a matter of a couple minutes on a roller. It's not quite that, but we can, based on blood flow and based on just the lymphatic fluids being able to move in and up through your body and then excrete it back out of the body, the foam roller can do a lot of really good. And when recovery is the goal for soft tissue work or foam rolling, it kind of doesn't matter. Like, I hate to say it, but the science is pretty clear on this. Just the stimulus of the foam roller regionally on an area of the body. And as long as you're breathing deep, 
di diaphragmatic breaths. That's going to be key because we do have science on that as well. Foam rolling is useless without the breath. Breath plus soft tissue work can be a really nice recovery modality. But you want to be focusing in on the big, broadly attached muscles in the body. We're thinking about the lats, the pecs, the glutes, the upper back, the quads, the calves, things that have a dense muscle belly to them or a broadly attaching origin insertion point. Those just give you the best amount of ability to push blood flow where we want it, but also to have coursing of different regions that are a little bit more complete. In terms of recoverability, um, you don't want to play your own physical therapist, like trying to isolate out your supraspinatus with your fingertip and thinking that it's going to be a recovery tool. Mm -hmm. It's not. Global foam rolling is what we recommend for recoverability, and that's done on off days or four to six hours after a training session in the same day after a training session. And this could be something as simple as a couple minutes up to I have clients that really like it, and they'll do uh, an hour in front of the, the Packers football game on Sundays. Uh, I'm curious, just like, what is your routine now um, as far as lifting and recovery and also eating around uh, either pre or post workout, what type of routine do you, uh, I'm sure it's changed over the years, but what are you working on right now? I'm a practice what you preach model. So everything that we've been talking about today, I buy into it because I believe in it so much that I would put my own body on the line for it. Uh, I run a very specific training model, very similar to the types of methods that I would be using with my one-on-one -on -one clients, with my team training clients on functional strength training, and a lot of my programs that I put out throughout the years. Um, I, I base it off of a P4 sequence. A P4 sequence means that I have a six phase dynamic warm up. That's my preparation, the first P. I have a big power primer is my second piece, something ballistic, something explosive, something that feels athletic, moving your whole body through space and like being able to like actually feel good doing it. And that's usually a power or skill-based movement. The third P is performance. So I want to be able to get stronger at a functional movement over time. Um, we really sit within the squat, the single leg work and the hinge for the lower body and then pushing and pulling for the upper body, more specifically pull-ups and uh, some sort of horizontal base pressing. And then our off or the, the last P of the P4 is a pump base effect. So working hypertrophy and metabolic stress. So that's driving a lot of blood flow into the localized tissues. It helps for recoverability, but it also gets you jacked and builds muscle and builds capacity, which is always a good thing. And what I what I deem this is a, a multimodalic based training approach, meaning that we're training power, we're training strength, we're training hypertrophy and metabolic conditioning all within one single training session. I'll do that uh, four days a week. And on those off days between, it'll look very similar to what we talked about with the recoverability. So I've been doing sled work. We'll be doing bike, uh, aerodyne bikes, banded walking on a treadmill, jogging, elliptical, a little bit of everything. And then those days, I also work in some linchpin work. So whatever it is that I'm working on trying to bring up maybe a weak link, I'll dedicate maybe 10 to 15 minutes of that. Uh, lately, it's been core. So I've been working more of like a three-dimensionalized, trying to get all of my angles done, training my core from more of like a stimulatory perspective over the last six to eight weeks. But this is a training protocol that looks very similar to many of the clients that I have just because we all have similar needs today. Like no matter what you're doing, uh, we're sitting at a computer right now doing this podcast. And I have a lot of clients and a lot of athletes that are sitting from their phones and their computers and have very similar lifestyles, even though they may be doing things totally different in the professional world. So interesting. So you call it the, uh, the four P or the P four, <laughs> the P four, um, sort of progression, I guess, or, um, uh, uh, outline for your workouts. So you're not necessarily, you're, are you doing pretty much total body during those or are you? This is a good question. So yeah. I specifically at a four day, like heavy lifting split, we'll do an upper lower emphasized and I'll put a key pattern emphasis on each and every one of the days. So day one will be a squat emphasis day for lower body. Day three will be a upper body emphasis push day. Day five will be a hinge day for lower body emphasis. And day six will be a pull day emphasis for the upper body. Yeah. And the key performance indicators are the hardest and the heaviest mover that day will indicate the emphasis of that day. 
But when you have four, five, six, seven days a week to train, full body is not going to be your best approach. Full body is really geared towards one, two, and three days per week. As soon as you have over three, just from a distributing of volume and intensities and recoverabilities perspective, there are very... Uh, there are very good benefits to being able to split your intensities and volumes up a little bit over the course of an additional day. You essentially have 25% more time, even if your timestamps on training per week are the same. Yeah, that's a good point because like for my training, I've added in more volume throughout the week um, instead of, I never, I was never a total body, but I would only hit legs once a week for a while. And now, now I do it twice a week. And it, I find that, yeah, it's, I'm getting much, more, much better gains from that. Here's uh, something interesting yeah. from a patterns perspective, or even from a, uh, muscular hypertrophy and strength perspective, there's really quality research out there time and time again, with every new study coming out, showing the benefits of being able to hit every muscle group or with our terminology, every muscle region two times per week. There is huge benefit compared to one time per week. And this goes against like this old school, like dogmatic bodybuilding approach where you just like fucking hammer your biceps on day one, you hammer your triceps on day two, you do legs one time per week, and then you cycle that all through. Yeah. Take it with a grain of salt because uh, we know that there's a little bit more to that sort of hypertrophy program than just what's being eaten and what's being done in the gym. If you get my gist, but there are benefits to being able to hit two plus times per week at each region. That tends to be the real sweet spot. And I was seeing programs uh, crash and burn that are doing three, four, five times a week frequency in those areas. That's too much. And then I've seen down to zero or one time per week. That is not enough. So I think always balancing out that pendulum swing, that's usually the best benefit that 80 plus percent of people can really get into. Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, what I, I noticed you say you have the seven habits of h highly healthy people. And, uh, one, number one was eating a quantity controlled whole food based diet. Maybe explain a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, I changed my mind because that's not number one anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that article was from a couple of years ago. Oh, got you. Okay. I would say it was pre COVID. It uh -huh. was a pre COVID. So back then it was like, yeah, you know, eating a quantity controlled whole foods based diet. Yeah. It's still cool today, but that's number two today. Okay. Number one, mental health. Mental health is the biggest key mover that we have today when it comes to our overall health, our biological health, our systemic health, our mechanical health, our orthopedic health. Really, we've been struggling over the last three years, and we didn't really realize it to the point where this is having a negative impact across our entire life, different avenues of our life. And I think we need to just talk about that first. But secondly, more specific to your question, I defined it pretty simply there, right? It's like it didn't sound too dogmatic on like the nutritional recommendation, no. like know how much of what you're eating and try to eat quality things that are one ingredient, whole foods based sourcing. Wow. Uh, well, it's not keto. Uh, it's not low carb. It's not high carb. It's not any of this other stuff that gets so much attention today. Mm -hmm. It's again, very similar to our training. It's principle based and principle based allows freedoms where people need freedoms, but it also makes sure that we are hitting the big key levers that we can continuously pull to make sure that people are moving in the right direction with their nutritional fueling and intakes that can, again, be a huge, huge contributor to overall health, but also fitness goals. Yeah. So looking at the list, the last one was breathe, meditate, and show gratitude daily. Maybe that goes to the top. Yeah, that, that about. one's going up. <laughs> 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 yeah, because that'll help with mental health. Um, what would you say, you know, you talk about we talked about cardio and sprinting. Um, and I know you mentioned it twice per week. Cardio is like something that I mess around with not a lot. I, I walk probably two, three times a day with my dogs, uh, but I don't do a ton of cardio. But sprinting, what else could individuals do that may be you know, because you see all you see is thousands of ellipticals and what maybe are better ways to implement cardio into your routine as opposed to just going on an elliptical. There are many ways. There are yeah. many ways to be able to train the heart. And when you say cardiovascular training or cardiovascular conditioning, it's essentially trying to focus in on your heart's response to stress. 
if you think about it like that, you're like, oh, cool. Like I can do a bunch of different shit. As long as my heart rate maintains or gains or goes up and down in the way that I want it in these specific ranges, then the modality of your conditioning or cardio is less important than the overall stimulus. Mm -hmm. But let's just call it what it is. We have two different camps in the industry. We have the cardio only camp. And that is very, very popular. It was started in the 60s where it got super popular, where we had scientific journals saying like, yo, fuck strength training. All we need for health and longevity is cardio. Heart health is all that matters. Cool. We made it through the 60s, the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. We're like, okay, I think we're starting to see some benefit in resistance training. 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010 comes. Even this year, we have an exercise study that's showing that, hey, resistance training, not even strength training, but resistance training, any form of resistance, including a cardiovascular training component is most likely the healthiest thing that you can possibly do. And then a new meta just came out uh, a couple months ago saying that, yeah, uh, it doesn't really matter what you do, but just have a well-rounded approach to being physically active. Exercise in itself is the goal. Exercise in itself is the benefit. Even if you never lose weight, even if you never get stronger, just the process of exercising routinely and consistently provides immense amounts of benefits. Whoa, okay. So what does that mean for cardio? For my clients, I'd like them to get two to three days a week of heart race based training in. And this looks two to three different modalities for us. I like to do things called functional strength circuits. Functional strength circuits take a submaximal weight and we essentially do three to five exercises without rest while we're moving through extended ranges, we're moving through more cyclical based full body movements that tend to get the heart rate up, but don't skyrocket it the way that like a Bulgarian split squat 5RM would. And then we have a 60 to 90 second window where we try to bring the heart rate back down. So metabolic conditioning is what that is. You know, you could even call it HIT. HIT is a super popular term today. So that is one way to get it in. You could do the same type of heart rate training on something like your air bike. Boom. Work for 60 seconds or however long it took. Rest and get your heart rate back down into a recoverable zone and then repeat that for a multiple bouts. That is one way. So I like to do that one to two times a week with people. But then there are benefits for two to three additional days, anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes, where we're doing low intensity, low joint stress, steady state cardio, L-I-I-S-S -S cardio. And this could be done on anything. Again, loaded walking is a really, really nice one. It's accessible to people, throw on a weighted vest or be a super weirdo and like push a sled or pull a, a drag a sled in your neighborhood. Like mm -hmm. you'll meet some interesting friends doing that. That's really nice for people to be able to do at home. It's not gym dependent or just get on that cardio machine, get on that bike, get on that elliptical, get on that step trainer, get on the treadmill. The key is that you don't kill your joints in the process and you get the heart rate work necess necessitated for from what the science is pointing at, uh, a high quality and uh, a life of longevity. Yeah. And, and you talk about, you know, metabolic, would you say, um, not metabolic, but you talk about just as far as getting the heart rate up, let's just say you could do strength training exercises that probably hit, kill two birds with one stone sort of thing, right? Where you're getting stronger, but you're also raising the heart rate quite a bit, right? I, I mean, you could. Yeah. Definitely. I need to be able to talk about where, you know, we have these two different stimuli. So strength training and doing strength training fast, yes, that can be done and that can have a benefit for overall movement. But the way that the heart interacts with the pumping through the body without get, trying to get too technical, mm -hmm. there are different benefits to having cyclical motions happen. So there gotcha. is a combination between those two things being used at once. Right. I guess if you're talking just pure strength and you're doing lower reps, you're going to have to rest longer. And, 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 and that's geared more towards just strength training. Like hypertrophy would be something where you're what eight to 12 reps in that range. Um, there you could probably get some, get the heart rate up a little bit doing those. Sometimes what I'll do, and I don't know what your thoughts on this is, is like in between sets, I'll do, you know, maybe I'll do ball slams or something like that in between my sets of lifting as a way to be just become efficient and get, you know, get it done. 
My, my big argument to strength training, if it's done correctly, is that if you have to do something as a feeder between your sets of strength work, then you're simply not pushing the strength work hard enough. I know we get done with a set that's taken to form failure, and it's really taken to the brink of where it needs to be from a, a stimulus perspective. You're going to need that minute, two minutes, maybe even three minutes if it's a power or strength-based movement to come back in and repeat bout to get the necessary volume to create a, a really nice stimulus. But there are different ways to like feed in fillers into your workouts. One of my favorite ones is not to just sit there and fucking text or Instagram for three minutes between squat sets, but to be able to do mobility work, to be able to do yeah. something like breathing or even isolated core movements and being able to not take away from the strength, but also not waste three minutes, wasting three minutes over multiple sets. You're sitting around on the bench, texting half your session, and there's nothing healthy about that. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it might be what's necessitated to make gains, but we can do other non-competing things in the rest periods. And I think that's the beauty of uh, what we call like a density-based session. How much total work can you get in in X amount of time? The more density goes up, the more overall workload goes up. And that's a form of progression in itself. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you see that nowadays more and more, right? Just like everyone's on their cell phones and in between sets. And you could be doing, like I, I noticed some of your posts, like accessory work, right? Like on your shoulders, um, just working on building like the small muscles per se, um, as opposed to just sitting there or doing like some core work as well. Um, so love that. What, uh, let's see what else, what would you say that, um, some of the big levers that you move with your clients as far as, I don't know if you were going to say food based, I know you said whole food based diet. What if someone says, well, how can I eat before and after a workout? What would be optimal ways to, what, I guess, what are your thoughts regarding that? You hear a lot of different things with science coming out as far as pre and post, but what, what are your thoughts regarding that? It's really going to be dependent on people's lifestyles and their sustainability for that specific mode of eating in their lifestyle. I'll yeah. take myself for an example. Um, I get up five or six. I'm already training by seven, seven thirty. I tend to go in fasted the last three or four years. I drink electrolytes. I drink carbohydrates while I train and I feel just fine. My performance doesn't dip towards that. I have clients that go, Hey, what are you doing? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing, but you shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. You need to be doing what you need to be doing. And they'll try something like that and they'll be half as strong and they'll feel like shit and they'll be puking in the bucket. Finding what works for you in terms of timing is key because this is the ultimate goal. How do I fuel appropriately throughout the day in order to feel my best when it's time to perform? Ultimately, we are going to be performing in the gym, maybe 45 to 75 minutes per day, multiple times per week. And the rest of our life should just be like super chill. It doesn't always work out that way, but that is what our goal is. So trying to figure out ways that fuel that and feel your best while you need to be performing, that is really going to be key. But I, I'm not a huge one on the dogmatic diets. Uh, I'm not a fad dieter. I, I listen to my clients when they have specific goals or wants or needs. But ultimately, kind of being middle of the road and a common sense of habitual approach to nutrition, especially fueling and uh, frequency timing, I, we don't do anything too crazy. But too crazy are usually the things that get somebody excited and then let them down. And then they end up saying things like, oh, diet didn't work for me. Exercise didn't work for me. No, the process was unsustainable and that didn't work for you. Right. Yeah, you make a good point. I think long-term sustainability of anything that you're doing, whether it's workouts or diet, is important. Um, you see this in the diet industry because I have a lot of people on my podcast where you have people on all ends of, of the spectrum, the carnivores to the to the vegetarians. And you know, it, one could work for one person, probably might not work for the other person. Um, so I like the fact that, you know, not being dogmatic about that, I think is important. Um, it's huge because if yeah. you're going to be a coach, you have to strive to be a generalist and you have to have an appreciation for different ends of the spectrums. But being a generalist means that you need to problem solve no matter who's in front of you. And if you're just trying to give everyone the same thing, you're no longer a coach, you're a dictator and you're a pusher of bias. And that's not necessarily a great thing for 80% of the people that will likely end up falling through the cracks. 
Yeah. And I noticed on one of your posts, you mentioned, forget the scale, focus on small wins. Um, I love that. Maybe can you dive into that a little bit? Small wins are huge. When it comes to being able to, again, have a movement or a health practice for life, you know, what does it mean about your workout today or even tomorrow or a week from now, or a month from now, a year from now? The focus should be on moving forward, leaner, healthier, stronger, more resilient than ever decade by decade. And the small, the seemingly small things that we can do today, they compound over time. And it sounds super cliche, but having a strong and stable lifestyle that you can count on, that you can automate with your own self so you can focus on other key movers, that's going to be a slow moving process, but it's going to be a process that will work and is battle tested and time tested to get you eventually where you want to be. So many times we think about the process as being an end goal or an end destination, but that's not the way health and fitness works. It is the journey that needs to be enjoyable. It is the journey that needs to keep that fire kindling inside of yourself. And if you're not having success with the journey or you're not easing the journey as you go, then most likely that journey is going to come to an end. You're going to have to restart it 10 miles back from where you started before. So thinking about it like that, it's the most unsexy answer in the world, but it's just straight (laughs) up truth. Yeah. And you mentioned that and like, I enjoy my workouts. I look forward to going to the gym and working out. Uh, maybe it takes some time to get to that point. And, and that's not to say that has that you have to like love it per se to do it. But I think it just comes with time. And if you're doing things that you're enjoying, you're going to be doing them for a long time. So maybe you need someone, maybe you need a workout partner, right? Maybe you need a, a coach to sort of help you through that process. We hear this a lot. And it's not like you have to be in love with the process of exercising. <laughs> the majority right. of people will not be. But there are two things that tend to motivate people at a deeper level where they no longer need motivation. It is part of their life in the way that they live. One is having a process that they are autonomous with and they choose themselves. It's not dictated upon them, but they naturally and organically are gravitated towards X training approach or nutritional approach. Cool. They have ownership in it. Second thing is this shit's got to work. You know, if all day, every day you're thinking and putting in the mental, emotional, monetary investments into this stuff, and it simply lets you down, results are still king. If it doesn't produce a result, then it most likely will not be adhered to long term. Taking that approach needs to make sure that the things are fun enough, but also hard enough to elicit the stimulus that we can get better from. But over time, People are going to ebb and flow into different evolutions, especially with my clients. I see it all the time. I'm there to facilitate these evolutions and find things that excite them, but also know very well that there are certain non-negotiables in sort of their lifestyle, their training, their nutrition, their health practices that they know are going to be those cornerstones of the way that they live. But it's no one set in stone thing. We are constantly rebuilding ourselves. And I think that's part of the beauty of the journey. Yeah. And um, I know we're coming up on it here in a little bit. What would you say? And you've given a lot of good tips. So I'll just, but I usually ask this for all my clients and not my clients, all my, all my guests, what one tip would you give an individual that's looking to, you know, maybe they're in their forties, fifties and sixties, and they want to sort of get their body back to what it once was maybe five, 10, 15 years ago. What one tip would you give that individual? Start today but don't start everything today. Our biggest mover is going to be resistance training mixed with cardiovascular training. In addition to knowing what's going in your body and monitoring that over time, it's the triad that will essentially give you results if you can maintain it. So thinking about that is going to be an approach going into new year's, right? Hmm. We're going to want to do everything all at once. And that's not going to be a smart move. What we need to be doing is taking a step-by-step approach forward, prioritizing the biggest movers that also excite you and you're also really bought into, and simply moving forward and getting on that path to success. You know, staying on the path is really the key. But again, this is going to be hard to communicate without the support, without the accountability, the motivation, the education from a, a fitness professional, a coach, a mentor by your side. That's the reason that we're in the profession. I love that. Start today, but don't start everything. (laughs) Good point. Great points. Um, 
All right, Dr. John. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate you dropping all this knowledge on us. And where's the best place for people to find you? Dr. John Russin at Instagram, Facebook, drjohnrussin.com. And the Pain-Free Performance Specialist Certification is at getppsc.com. You can check out free information, resources over there, and also our products. Awesome. I'll put links in the show notes for all that. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine, and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.